Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon sponsored review time again, and once more, we're looking at a pair of Pokemon episodes! I know, right? Completely unbelievable that I'd cover that franchise. This one's actually a similar case to another Patreon-sponsored review two years ago, wherein I looked at Ash's battle with Skyla in Season 15 of the show. Skyla had come up with air battles, wherein she just imagined how the battle would go, and thus decided whether she'd hand out a badge or not. An appropriate title, then, because only someone airheaded would think that that's a good idea. In the ensuing fight, Ash taught her how that system is stupid, and he defeated her. Not a perfect two-parter, plenty of things wrong with them, but the battles featured were fun and exciting, and I had enjoyed reviewing them. And, well, a patron decided they wanted to see me cover more of Ash's journey through Unova, because we have another pair of episodes where he takes on a gym leader. This time, it's Elisa, the electric-type gym leader. Although, to once again harken back to my old Pokemon White randomized Nuzlocke, her gym became Steel-type, and the first trainer we encountered killed our beloved E11, damn it. Otherwise, I gave a lot of my thoughts on Gen 5, Yanova, and other stuff back in the other review, so check it out if you get a chance. Otherwise, the only thing really to say is that this is coming up on Pokemon's 25th anniversary, so happy birthday! It's a franchise I've played since I was a kid, and my brother even found my old Game Boy Pocket I played it on. I thought I sold this thing years ago. Definitely don't have the original cartridge, though and I'll likely keep playing it until I'm an old man. For better or worse, good games are bad, I love me some Pocket Man, so here's to 25, and here's to the next 25. And of course, we know the best way to celebrate it around here, to snark on it a bit. Let's dig into the first two episodes of Season 15 of Pokemon, Enter Elisa, Electrifying Gym Leader, and Dazzling the Nimbasa Gym. We open with Ash excitedly arriving at Nimbasa City Gym. Finally, the Nimbasa City Gym! I can't wait to win a gym badge! Ho ho ho, hold on there, Ash! If this is anything like the games, first you need to go have a creepy conversation with N on a Ferris wheel, where he reveals that he is the leader of Team Plasma. Who do you think you are trying to skip a cutscene? So this is the Nimbasa Gym! So this is really awkward establishing dialogue. Look out, look out, look out, look out! Look out, look out, look out. Look out, I forgot how to open my eyes and I'm flailing out of control like an idiot! After knocking Ash into a fountain, we see that this is Bianca, a supporting character in the games whom Ash and company have run into before. Perhaps after the theme song that I don't really care for, she'll explain why she was running out of control and not looking where she was going. You see, I came to Nimbasa City to have a gym battle. And I figured I'd tackle anyone who got in my way, so move it, shorty! Yeah, this was actually a recurring thing with her in the show, but... What the hell? Anyway, Ash is annoyed not by getting soaked in the fountain, but because he's here for a gym battle too, and he got here first. For your information, I made an appointment. A concept that Ash is then severely confused by later on when battles with Skyla were done by appointment. Man, my joke in that episode about having no long-term memory from their age resetting just keeps getting more and more evidence. Silen suggests they let the gym leader decide, and Bianca tells them about said gym leader, Elisa. Elisa's kind of a weird gym leader in the games. It's established both in the games and the anime that she also has a secondary career outside of being a gym leader. She's a fashion model. Ah, oh, great. Watch as she creates some kind of magnetic field that she can use to predict how a battle will go so she can focus more on her modeling career rather than her gym duties. 
No, the weird part here is twofold. First is that in black and white, her gym is located in the amusement park. As one of the rides, a roller coaster system bringing you around to fight the gym trainers. Secondly, it's one of the worst roller coasters ever. It's basically just a high-speed tram car. You're in a completely enclosed space. Man, you know that Disneyland has a lot of problems. Why a fashion model's gym is in there is unclear, though in the sequel games they moved her gym to a catwalk stage and dyed her hair black. And for some reason you still have to go through the roller coasters to get in there. This is a weird season finale of Project Runway. But yeah, check out Elisa on this magazine cover and her bizarre computer mouse headphones. Or maybe it's just the latest design from Beats by Dredna. Ooh, check it out. 23 ways to spice up your relationship using apricorns and berries. Pomeg berries are an aphrodisiac. When they try to enter, they discover the gym is closed due to Elisa currently at a fashion show. Bianca heads out to go check out the show. Well, what about you? Without a gym leader, I guess I'm stuck. Yeah, it's a pity there's nothing else to do at Nimbasa City, like go on the battle subway, or enjoy the amusement park, or the sports stadium, or the musical theater, or the battle institute. Yep, basically just a Pokemon Center and a gym. I kid. He apparently did some of that stuff in the previous episodes, and some of the ones afterwards. As such, they decide to go to the fashion show to see if Ash can learn anything about Elisa before their match. Sensing that Ash is a main character, Elisa jumps off the runway in the middle of her show and goes down, admiring Pikachu since they're not native to the Unova region. Is this your Pikachu? Yeah, my name's Ash. Hi, I'm Iris. Shut up, kid. If you don't have a Pikachu, I don't care. Introductions are made, and of course, their desire to battle her. All right, I'll meet you all at the gym after the fashion show. Oh god, that's right! I'm still in the middle of the fashion show! Later, the gym does indeed incorporate the roller coaster idea, to better effect than in the game. Though that does make me wonder if there's a height limit then to actually fight at this gym. Or what happens if the trainer has a handicap that would prevent them from riding it? And oh god, neither Pikachu nor Axew were strapped down! They could have fallen to their deaths! Why is Pokémon such a dystopia?! Welcome to the Nimbasa City Gym! The Nimbasa City Gym is not responsible for any lost items that were thrown clear during the ride. Bianca's up first because she had the appointment, but we actually incorporate another thing from the games here. Bianca's father, who is here and wants to take her home. He was much more strongly opposed to Bianca's journey in the game, but Elisa made him see it was selfishness on his part to want her to stay home. A similar thing's happening here, where he feels a Pokemon journey is just too dangerous for someone so young. And in this guy's defense, on his journey, Ash has almost drowned, almost frozen to death, almost been killed in a volcanic eruption, had guns aimed at him, turned to stone, been repeatedly electrocuted, got involved in a gang war, and my god, that's just the Indigo League! I haven't even mentioned how he met God and has time traveled on multiple occasions! Bianca refuses to leave, and Elisa suggests showing off how much she's grown up on her journey via the gym battle. Thus, she agrees that if she loses the battle, she'll come home. And thus, the battle begins, observed by all these cardboard cutouts of children. First up is Elisa's Zebstrika versus Bianca's Shelmet. Who's that Pokemon? Oh, Jigglypuff seen from above! Shelmet, the snail Pokemon. Shelmet can spit a sticky, poisonous acid when attacking. And we let children stuff them in tiny balls so they will obey their every whim. Zebstrike is fast and easily evades the attacks sent against it, managing to knock out Shelmet. Next up is her Mincino. I wonder how Mincino will deal with Zebstrike's speed. Now, you swift! Not a bad strategy, actually. Swift is a move that can't miss, so it should be able to balance out Zebstrike's. <laughs> Oh, right, we're in the anime, where we pick and choose arbitrarily which game mechanics we follow at any given point. Silly me, lest I forget last time, where a healing move can now block electric attacks. By the way, during this fight, we keep seeing glimpses of Bianca's dad, and he's got this smug smile on his face that just makes me want to punch him. Look, I'm being facetious and jokey when it comes to the dangers of the Pokemon world. I mean, let's face it, what advantage would being older actually have served Ash against Mewtwo or any other dangerous situation he found himself in on his journey? More maturity and level-headedness, maybe, but the character was meant to grow and get better, and he legitimately did mature a bit as a result of his travels. Bianca actually started her journey later than the normal 10 years old that most trainers do, and this asshole is just standing there like, 
Ha! I enjoy watching my daughter get beaten, even though she had to have defeated three previous gym leaders in order to get to this point. It kind of makes me wish he was acting more aggressively douchey, since instead he's just got this air of smarm and superiority about him that makes him more insufferable. Anyway, halfway point of the first episode. Who's that Pokemon? I see you're late. Ash already asked and answered. After Minchino got defeated by the same flame charge and double kick combo that took down Shelmet, Bianca sends out her last Pokemon. Pignite, the evolved form of the fire starter of Black and White. This is actually a more even matchup. Minchino and Shelmet are base form Pokemon with not great stats and some weaknesses to Zebstrika's moveset. But Pignite's an evolved form and neutral to anything Zebstrika could use on it. It's a better battle than the others with some good back and forth, but ultimately Bianca loses. Her father's ready to take her back home, but she wants to check on Shelmet first, who clearly needs a visit to a Pokemon Center. But Iris has something else in mind. I've got just the thing. This should help Shelmet feel a whole lot better. Booze. Now, the Holistic Potion heals it up, even though Elisa comes out and suggests they all go to the Pokemon Center anyway. Thank God we had that sequence to eat up 30 seconds of screen time. While waiting at the center, Silent makes lunch for everyone. It's delicious. You're welcome. The secret ingredient is laxatives. Why is Elisa's weird bee-striped shirt the same color as her skin? No joke, I keep getting confused by that thing and thinking she's got, like, just a few straps down her front. After more compliments on his food, Silen lists off the ingredients. And for an extra kick, I add a little mustard. Also, grape jelly, which is the central ingredient in these donuts. As Bianca starts to leave, Iris pokes Ash to speak up. Hey, why don't you speak up? But her dad just says that, especially in light of some previous episodes, that he's just not convinced that Bianca's ready for all this, and she should try again later. After pretty much giving up, Iris and Silen once again prod Ash to speak up, and so he challenges her dad to a Pokemon battle to let her keep going. He had been a trainer himself, after all, so he should be able to handle that. This is dumb! What the hell does Ash beating him in a battle prove exactly? Shouldn't Bianca be the one challenging him? It's her story. All this would prove is that one of Bianca's friends was a good trainer, which doesn't make a difference for how he feels about Bianca's development. He wonders what Ash will do if he loses, so he says that if he wins, Ash has to return to Palatown. If you're confident you can win, then no problem, right? Oh, well in that case, shove a polka flute up your ass, guy who doesn't even have a name! Seriously, he has no name. He's only listed as Bianca's father. What is this supposed to prove? He's trying to defend his friend and you're just like, yeah, your hopes and dreams should be abandoned if you can't beat me, someone who may have massively overleveled Pokemon. Ash agrees and Elisa acts as the judge of the match. The battle begins. <laughs> You see, Ash, when I was a young man, I was called the Red Meteor. So, Char as Noble survived his final battle with Amuro and then ended up in the Pokemon world? Does he just always have that outfit on under his business suit? Ash's Oshawott comes out and wants to fight, taking on Bianca's dad's Darmanitan. And this guy continues to piss me off because he hurts Oshawott, who in my humble opinion is the best of the Unova starters. Bianca tries to step in and stop this, but Ash is insistent. Bianca's father wants to know why he's so keen on defending Bianca. Ash, you're a total stranger. It shouldn't matter to you either way. Wrong! Bianca's my friend. Your friend? What is this friend you speak of? Is it something you forced to stay at home? Ash, Silent, and Iris talk about all their experiences they've had with her. While she's not a consistent companion of Ash's like them, she still spent a ton of time with them. Camping out, eating together, etc. Eating together from the same pot. Drinking from the same waterfall? And then spitting it out again when we realize the deerling have pooped at the top of the waterfall. With a final collision between Darmanitan and Oshawott, Oshawott is knocked out. Ash loses. So, one of the things that annoys people about the Black and White series is that it's essentially a soft reboot. 
Not a complete reboot, of course. There were still callbacks and appearances by past friends and team members, especially later on near the end. They even had a bit which flashed back to his Indigo League days, redone in the newer animation style they were utilizing at the time. But there were a lot of times it felt like they were basically starting from square one. Pikachu seemed depowered. Team Rocket, at first, were played as a serious threat as opposed to their beloved jokey natures. They even got new uniforms during that time. Ash's character development seemed to be a bit reset. And let's not even get into the middle finger that was the League, wherein Ash didn't use any of his old Pokemon whatsoever, despite that being one of the best parts of the League battles, seeing Ash utilizing his full capabilities for the most exciting battles of each series. And he lost to someone who only had five Pokemon on his team and didn't understand the concept of registering. And then we have instances like this. Bianca's dad, some rando who doesn't even have a friggin' name, probably is very out of practice, beats Ash. Ash Ketchum, for all we make fun of him for, up to this point, was offered a position as a Frontier Brain, beat the Orange League, and scored in the top four of the previous league, losing only to some asshole with legendaries on his team. And then Ash loses... to this dickweed! Now, let's be fair, of course. Oshawott's a first-stage Pokémon, and Ash resets his team in every new league, save for Pikachu, and the show would be boring if Ash won every single battle and all that jazz. But stuff like this is just kinda bullcrap. I mean, just, just think about this. Elisa is going to lose to Ash, and yet, Ash loses to this guy! Just wow. Anyway, of course Bianca's father says he doesn't have to go back to Palatown. The battle reminded him of the good times of when he had his own journey, regardless of the dangers. And indeed, Bianca can go on her journey as well. Making our pets fight has proven to me that camping out at night with friends is more important than surviving potential brushes with creatures that have power over space and time. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Just feels a bit weaker than it should be is all. Not helped by Bianca immediately, and I mean immediately saying, Oh, by the way, I'm going to the desert resort, bye! That's barely an exaggeration, which even Ash and company are taken aback by that after they just got her dad to lay off of her! Criminy. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> no thanks to you, Ash, and all you did to convince my father to change his ways, eat a dicklet! Her father runs after her because she left her bag behind. Elisa says she'll have her battle with Ash in the next episode, or next day. So, yeah, let's start off dazzling the Nimbasa gym. We begin with Ash actually working on strategizing the best way of fighting her. Shockingly, pun fully intended, he decides he doesn't want to use Pikachu in this fight, feeling like he's been leaning on him too much as of late. Man, if only I had a Donphan or a Gibble or a Gliscor or a Torterra, then maybe I'd have some kind of massive type and level advantage or something. Actually, Ash will be swapping out Pokémon, but during Unova, he swapped through only the ones he had caught in the region. In some ways, you could argue that that was just symbolic of how in the original Black and White games, you were only able to use the Unova region Pokémon until after you had already beaten the game, but I see it just as, shut up, we only care about promoting the new stuff, screw continuity. Anyway, back to the Nimbasa Gym. And that's when a trainer with a heart condition is sued the hell out of the Nimbasa gym. Elisa's fangirls cheer her on as they prepare to fight. I like the glow on your face too! Now he's radioactive! That can't be good! Why is the referee dressed like she's going to skydiving lessons after this? Feel the spark and feel the tingle! Watch me mix and mingle! Why wasn't she this extra against Bianca? Like before, Zebstrika is up first. Ash has obtained his Palpitoad, which is water and ground type and therefore immune to electric attacks. On top of that, the water typing creates a resistance against flame charge, so indeed, Ash has got something that should make this fight be over and done with in five minutes. However, type matchups aren't everything, and in the anime, that's especially the case. Now that's an exceptionally tasty strategy! Shows like this really want to convince kids that once you enter into a career, your entire way of talking revolves around your job. 
It'd be like if I was watching a sports game, I'd be constantly saying crap like, man, they really inked that panel, or he moved like sequential art, or even, wow, this is overpriced. Minor annoyance, they reused the same animation for Flame Charge multiple times in an obvious bit of cost saving. Of course, Zeb Strike is still super fast and Flame Charge boosts its speed, so after a bit of repeated shots, it manages to kick Palpitoad several times. Still, it fights back and manages to knock Zeb Strike out. Unfortunately, Ash's overconfidence after that victory gets the best of him, and he keeps Palpitoad out against Elisa's next Pokemon, Emolga, aka every generation needs a Pikachu variant, so here's Pikachu. Pikachu, but it can fly. It uses a tract, which basically makes Palpatode temporarily fall in love with it. I told you I'd dazzle you two, didn't I? Yeah, actually, you've said it like three times now. I haven't commented on it until now, and it's getting kind of annoying, come to think of it. At least Silent varies up the food puns a bit. Palpatode is down. You can't be serious! I was gonna win every battle with you! Again, character regression. Ash has long since learned that he can't rely on one team member for everything. Well, Ash needs to bring out his next Pokemon. Uh, give me a few minutes, Elisa. Huh? Uh huh? Your incompetence is staggering. And a few minutes later, he comes back. If I may, you didn't by chance bring just Palpito, did you? <laughs> No! No, 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 no. I will make fun of Ash Ketchum. I will criticize Ash Ketchum, but there is no way, none whatsoever, that he just chose not to bring his other Pokemon. They're his teammates and friends for Dome's sake. When the hell would he just leave them somewhere for no reason? I mean, even if you wanted to accept that he didn't think he'd need them and gave them, like, a vacation day at the Pokemon Center or something, it's not unprecedented for Team Rocket to show up and interrupt the battle and he'd need them all on hand! I get it, it's a joke, but it is a joke that requires you to put aside everything we know about him! Just what the hell?! And just... The gym let him do that?! Everyone was just standing around with their thumbs up their asses waiting? Ugh. Anyway, he brings out Snivy and Imolga uses a tract again. And Ash counters with Snivy using a tract. It does not work, much to Ash's confusion. By any chance, does your Snivy happen to be a female? Uh, of course! I totally forgot! I was just now wondering if there's anything that could actually push my headache into a full-blown migraine, and there you are. How many times will it take for Ash to learn that a track doesn't work between girls? Hear that, kids? Lesbians don't exist in Pokemon! Although neither does Ash's brain, apparently, because this is evidently a recurring problem! Ah! Ash is unworried because Electric-type moves are ineffective against Grass-type Pokemon, but Elisa reminds him that Amalga is also a flying type. Which he should already know and remember, because Elisa pointed that out when it defeated Palpatone too! This poor child is getting dumber by the second! After no-selling Snivy's grass-type moves, Imolga starts attacking again. This recipe's starting to go sour! You're shit! You are so shit, you don't even realize what you do. Ironically, that clip applies to Ash right now, too. Now for a dazzling finish. Get a thesaurus, Elisa! Snivy gets taken down, and Ash, continuing his streak of dumbassery, sits down. The ref grows increasingly impatient with him, and his rambles to himself about his lack of type coverage. Meanwhile, in the background, Pikachu has been sparking at the bit to get in there, until it finally shocks him and goes, Let me in, coach, come on! I thought I needed to think up some sort of awesome plan by myself, but I forgot something. I can't battle without my Pokémon. Yeah, Ash. You were trying to think of a plan using your Pokemon. You weren't by yourself. All you did was say, hey Pikachu, I should make sure some other team members get some action so I'm not only relying on the same ones over and over. What the hell are you talking about? Although that is true, Ash, you are pretty useless by yourself right now. Now that's the Ash I know. Forget some plan. I'd say this is a great recipe for success. Taste it, taste it, taste it, taste it, taste it. 
Not an ounce of seasoning! Since both Pokémon are electric types, this battle will have to be decided on spirit! God, no wonder Bianca wanted to get away from you people as quickly as possible! Pikachu quickly, or rather quick attackly, defeats Amolga. Yes, I can make bad jokes too, but I acknowledge they're bad jokes. Elisa says some flowery stuff about how Ash and Pikachu are shining brightly like the stars or some such thing. I've never seen Elisa so serious about a challenger! Is there a gas leak in here? She's been talking like this the entire match! What is wrong with everyone? Ironically, given my remark at the start concerning my poor lost E11, Elisa's final Pokémon is Tynamo, the first form of Electros. Everyone is suitably confused by this choice, but not for long, since a tackle from Tynamo apparently hits like a frickin' truck and sends Pikachu into a wall. How much structural damage do gyms have to endure with these kinds of battles, especially when they keep putting holes in the walls? It's fast, too, even faster than Zebstrika, just zipping around and repeatedly slamming into Pikachu. As such, Ash's new strategy? Use Thunderbolt on everything! The walls, the audience, the ceiling, the floor, just unloading Thunderbolts everywhere! Oh my god, he snapped and he's taking everyone down with him! No, it's actually to create a smoke screen. There's only a single visible path to Pikachu, and Tynamo goes for it, but Pikachu uses Iron Tail and bats it into a wall, knocking it out and winning the match. You made me remember so much. A brilliant display is not the most important thing. Was that ever something you needed to learn? Anyway, Ash is awarded the Bolt Badge. Elisa recommends he head off to Driftvale City for the next gym battle, but then recalls that the drawbridge that would lead to it is currently closed. And so our episode ends with them deciding to go get something to eat. Thrilling. Anyway, these episodes kind of suck. They're not the worst episodes of Pokemon, but man, do they have narrative issues. Look, Ash is the main character and his actions help propel the plot forward, but having him be the one who settles things between Bianca and her father undermines her story. As far as this guy knows, Ash is just some random kid who knows his daughter. He seems taken aback by the reveal that Ash is a friend of hers, as if suggesting that someone being friends with Bianca is confusing and weird. Bianca isn't the one who changes her father's mind, or show some agency and self-determination on her own part. It's just Ash being the hero by losing to some random asshole. The battles in it are fine enough, but the story just doesn't really work. Not helped by unnecessary and lame padding, like them deciding to go eat in the Pokemon Center just for throwaway bits like, wow, the food is good. The second episode is pretty much just the gym battle. And while the animation is okay, Ash's utter cluelessness is distracting. Even if you wanted to ignore the five other leagues he has been in, he has been in Unova for three other gym battles. Don't tell me he ever thought, yeah, I'll just leave all my other Pokemon behind. And what's worse, the show actually seems to suggest that Ash was wrong to try to think up a plan. Sure, it turned out to be a bad plan since it was just, I'll only use one Pokemon in this fight, but Silent's reaction seems to suggest that Ash should only rely on his instincts. The same instincts that made him forget the rest of his Pokemon. Or try to punch Mewtwo that one time. And frankly, while the battles the themselves are not bad, the animation is not as well done as in the later fight with Skyla. It's okay, but nothing too spectacular. Elisa sudden, I've learned something today, is just friggin' puzzling, since it's not like she was ever expressing any kind of negative qualities. It's not like she was constantly spouting, the only thing that matters is if the battle looks good, or anything like that. Just a mediocre pair of episodes, in my opinion. Next time, we're taking a break so that the second episode of Late Night Double Feature covering an unusual and unexpected horror sequel and prequel can debut and hopefully incorporate your feedback from the pilot. In two weeks, we're back with another Patreon-sponsored episode covering a more light-hearted miniseries.
Hmm. A battle with a rich and bold quality. Ah. Disgusting. Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!